known as the crime of the century back in the day when it happened, and now still one of the most uh, high-profile crimes ever in the history of the United States, I would assume. Twas it was. Everybody knows uh, Charles Lindbergh, the famous aviator. Yeah, but uh, Charles Augustus Lindbergh Jr., Jr., 20-month-old son of the famous aviator and his mother, Anne Marl Lindbergh, was kidnapped about 9 p.m. on March 1st, 1932 from the nursery on the second floor of the Lindbergh home near Hopewell, New Jersey. Huh. The child's absence was discovered and reported to his parents, who were then at home at approximately 10 p.m. by the child's nurse, Betty Gow. Wow. A search of the premises was immediately made, and a ransom note demanding $50,000 was found on the nursery windowsill. After the Hopewell police were notified, the report was telephoned to the New Jersey State Police, who assumed charge of the investigation. <clears throat> so no FBI, huh? You think uh, they would have brought in the FBI for famous Charlie's uh, Lindbergh? They'd probably give it a couple hours before they do anything, right? Darren search at the kidnapping scene. Traces of mud were found on the floor of the nursery. Footprints, impossible to measure, were found under the nursery window. Two sections of the ladder had been used in the reach in the window. One of the two sections was split or broken where it joined to the other, indicating that the ladder had been broken during the ascent or descent, obviously, on the way down. Uh, there were no blood stains in or about the nursery, nor were there any fingerprints, obviously. So these guys left the ladder on the window? Well, it was broken in half. Did they break it in half? No, they could, why would they do that? Did they fall with the kid? I think so. Maybe they fell with the kid and then... Something happened to it right. then, so they had no choice. But I guess we yeah, were going a little too far in the story already. <laughs> but uh, household and estate employees were questioned and investigated. Colonel Lindbergh asked friends to communicate with the kidnappers, and they made widespread appeals for the kidnappers to start negotiations. Various underworld characters were dealt with in attempts to contact the kidnappers, kidnappers, and numerous clues were advanced and exhausted. So they're like. Reaching out to all the underworld guys, but come on, guys, you guys got to know something. Because right. you knew this, you knew back in the fifties and stuff, um, or the thirties. This is, yeah, um, this Lindbergh guy knew all the mafia dudes and all right. that shit oh, back then, dude. For especially sure, especially in New Jersey. I mean, come on, crazy. A second ransom note was received by Colonel Lindbergh on the sixth of March, nineteen thirty-two, postmarked Brooklyn, New York, March fourth, in which the ransom demand was increased to seventy thousand. Jeez. A police conference was then called to the governor by the governor at Trenton, New Jersey, which was attended by prosecuting officials, police authorities, and government representatives. All right. Various theories and policies of procedure were discussed. Private investigators were also employed. That should have been the first thing. Uh, were also employed by Colonel Lindbergh's attorney, Colonel Henry Breckenridge. Mm. Here's a letter of the ransom note. It says, dear, uh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it does say, too. It says, have 50000 with the money sign at the end of the 1000 which is stupid. Have fifty thousand ready. I think that's what it says. All right. Twenty five thousand in twenty dollar bills, five thousand or fifteen thousand in tens, something, something, ten thousand in five. So you want it, yeah. All broke um, down between twenty tens and fives. After two to four days we will inform you something where, you? where to deliver right. the money. We warn you something something Anything. Waking? Walking? Waking? Uh, anything. Oh, we warn you something making anything public. All right. Or notifying the police. Or notifying the police. The child is in safe care. Something, something for a follow-up. All right. I'm... Follow-up? 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 Or something. I don't know. Whoever wrote this wow. had the shittiest handwriting. In right. Room. Holy moly. Uh, there was a third ransom note that was received by Lindbergh's attorney on March 8th, informing that an intermediary appointed by the Lindberghs would not be accepted and requested a note in a newspaper. Uh, on the same date, Dr. John F. Condon, Bronx, New York City, who was a retired school principal, published in the Bronx Home News and offered to act as go-between and to pay an additional $1,000 ransom. Huh. They're already asking for seventy. All right. Uh, the following day, the fourth ransom note was received by Dr. Condon, which indicated he would be acceptable as a go-between. This was approved by Lindbergh, and about March 10, 1932, Dr. Conan received 70000 in cash as a ransom and immediately started negotiations for payment through newspaper columns using the code name Jaffsey. Okay. Oh, dang. So they didn't even call on the phone or nothing? Right. Well, I guess now. Around 8.30 p.m., 12th March, after receiving an anonymous phone call, Dr. Condon received fifth ransom note, delivered by Joseph Perrone, 
a taxi cab driver who received it from an unidentified stranger. Mm, that sounds like a mafia guy. Right. The message. Around. Right. The message stated that another note would be found beneath a stone at a vacant stand, 100 feet from an outlying subway station. They have uh, uh, five dollar footlongs over there. <laughs> this note, the sixth, was found by Condon as indicated. Following instructions therein, the doctor met an unidentified man who called himself John. Just call me John. At Woodlawn Cemetery, oh geez, near 233rd Street and Jerome Avenue. Okay, they discussed payment of the ransom money. The stranger agreed to furnish a token of the child's identity. Condon was accompanied by a bodyguard, while, except while talking to John. During the next few days, Dr. Condon repeated his advertisements, urging further contact, and stating his willingness to pay the ransom. Okay, why is Dr. I don't get it. Dr. Condon paying the ransom? Because well, he's the go-between guy. Right. Um, they're willing to pay. I don't understand why this is, they're right. taking it all crazy like this. Right. Well, a baby sleeping suit as a token of identity and a seventh ransom note were received by Dr. Condon on March 16th. The suit was delivered to Lindbergh and later identified. Condon continued his advertisements. The eighth ransom note was received by Condon on March 21st, insisting on complete compliance and advising that the kidnapping had been planned for a year. Wow. They're already in compliance. I don't understand. Right. What is going on here? He's already put out advertisements saying, we're in compliance, we got the ransom money. Right. What the hell is going on? Really? Dang. 29th March, Betty Gow, the Lindbergh nurse, found the infant's thumb guard. Thumb guard? Probably won't suck their thumb or something. Oh, Warren at the time of the kidnapping near the entrance to the estate. The following day, the ninth ransom note was received by Wait, Condon. Wait, so how she find this over two weeks later and the cops <laughs> right. didn't find it? Right. There's no way. Hmm. Mm. The following day, the ninth ransom note has re- was received by Condon, threatening to increase the demand to 100000 Why? And refusing a code for her- for use in newspaper columns. They're still making the-, the money keeps on going up and up and up, and these guys were like, guys dude. They're already like, hey, we already said we'd pay the 70 right. Wow. Well, there was a tenth ransom note, which was received by Dr. Condon on the 1st of April, 1932, instructing him to have the money ready the following night, to which Condon replied by an ad in the press. <laughs> The 11th ransom note was delivered to Condon on the 2nd of April, 1932, by an unidentified taxi driver who said he received it from an unknown man. Dr. Condon found the... T- how- you think somebody would get these guys' names? You're not going to identify this taxi driver? Un- 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 unidentified taxi driver. Right. Hmm. Dr. Condon found the 12th ransom note under a stone in front of a greenhouse at 3225 East Tremont Avenue in Bronx, New York. As instructed in the eleventh note, so we got twelve. All we're doing is like we get notes back and forth saying, "You better pay." Yeah, we will pay oh, since you're not paying <laughs> seventy-five. <laughs> but wait, we just said we'd pay. Well, no, we will pay the seventy-five. Yeah, we, but... we just like writing notes and hiding them under rocks. <laughs> <laughs> that's all that's happening here. Shortly thereafter, that on the same evening, by following the instructions contained in the twelfth note, Conan again met with whom he believed to be John to reduce the demand to fifty thousand. Oh, jeez. This amount was handed to the stranger in exchange for a receipt <laughs> and the 13th note containing instructions to the effect that the kidnapped child could be found on a boat named Nelly near Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. Wait, so hey. he gave him the 50000 right now? I think so. This amount was handed to the stranger right. in exchange for a receipt. But <laughs> okay. I got a text right off. <laughs> right. <laughs> Kidnapping. Right. Um, the stranger then walked north into the park woods. The following day, an unsuccessful search for the baby was made near Martha's Vineyard. An unsuccessful, unsuccessful search. Unsuccessful. The search was later repeated. Dr. Conan was positive that he would recognize John if he ever saw him again. I would hope so. Right. 12th of May, 1932. The body of the kidnapped baby was accidentally found, partly buried and badly decomposed, mm. about four and a half miles southeast of the Lindbergh home, 45 feet from the highway near Mount Rose, New Jersey, in Mercer County. And so they're having all these letters delivered in the Bronx, New York, when really they were the baby was already dead in I think, New Jersey. I think we're on to something here. I don't remember if they did an autopsy and all that. Yeah, I, I, don't, we'll, I don't know, but... I guess the, we'll find out. With the ladder being broke, yeah. it sounds like something happened to the baby right. there. Instantly. And then they were like, oh, shit, we got to keep this going. Hopefully right. we still get the money. Mm, I think so, because just how many? Four miles. Yeah. Four and a half miles. So they got four miles and away, and they're like, oh, man. Badly decomposed, and it was only been two months. So how long does it take for a body to de- decompose? Oh, so here we go. Called the death blow to the head. Yeah. He fell. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, they fell from that ladder. The discovery was made by Willem Allen, an assistant on a truck driven by Orville Wilson. 
The head was crushed. There was a hole in the skull, and some of the body members were missing. Jeez, so they... Wait, okay. Oh, jeez. Maybe eight? A coyote or something? The body was positively identified and cremated as Trent, at Trenton, New Jersey on 13th of May, 1932. The coroner's examination showed that the child had been dead for about two months, and that death was caused by a blow to the head. Yeah. So the child was dead as soon as... Soon. Because it was in March. Right. April, May. It's only been two months. Right. Yeah. Instant. Mm-hmm. I think something happened with that ladder. Yep. On uh, March 2nd, ni- there we go. March 2nd, 1932, after a conference with the Attorney General, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover oh, had, geez. well, this dude's still in the middle of chasing down the right. um, machine gun Kelly and all those right. guys. 1930, um, Capone. This dude's right. got his hands full. He does. Well, maybe he, maybe he we con- should take it easy on the right. guy. No. No, no. no. Well, he contacted the headquarters of the New Jersey State Police at Trenton. He officially informed the organization that the U.S. Department of Justice would... Afford Colonel H. Norman, Colonel H. Norman Schwartzkopf, superintendent of the New Jersey State Police, the assistance and cooperation of the FBI in bringing about the apprehension of the parties responsible for the kidnapping. So now we got the FBI involved oh, in this. Man. 